Okay, let's get started with the second lecture. Welcome back. So, yesterday I started with the first lecture on the biophysics tissues, deducing a vertex model. I did not really have the time to go also into continuum theories, but I think I will have time also to talk a little bit about it in the next lecture. So I will directly go to the second subjects and discuss signals and chemical um, patterns um, in tissues that sort of interplay with mechanical events and the biophysics I described yesterday. I will today first start with the morphogen gradients and growth control, and then depending on how much time there is, we'll also talk about planar cell polarity. So the theme is now that we discussed sort of the tissue as a mechanical network of cells in which we have forces, tensions that can drive rearrangements. Cell divisions are active processes. So it is an active material. And this um, active material is now guided with the help of chemical signals. Um, and this is a tight integration. And the first subject today will be to discuss self-organized growth, sort of this interplay between signals and force generation in a growth process that um, gives rise to an organization of tissue growth with the help of chemical feedbacks. Um, the second part, I will also discuss cell polarity and as a chemical anisotropies of cells, which can guide uh, spatially anisotropic processes in tissues. But let's talk about growth first. So now I'll go back to my favorite system, the developing imaginal wing disk in the larva of the fly, which then the pupa is remodeled to become the adult fly wing. And as mentioned yesterday, this is a small tissue which grows in about 10 rounds of cell division. And um, one can study that by taking out these discs at different stages of larval development and sort of just measuring the area. You can also look at the cell number and see how then the system grows in time. So here you see outlines of such discs at different times. This is a wild type wing disc, and here we have a wing disc shapes of discs of a fly that has a GFP labeled growth factor, morphogen DPP, which will become important in this, in this lecture. Usually this GFP is there in order to see this growth factor distributed in the tissue, but it also has a small phenotype in growth. You know, there's an overexpression of DPP in the system, and these have slightly different shapes. Just so you can notice that. And this is what the data looks like. So we also quantified anisotropies of growth, which I don't want to go into today. The area of the tissue is a function of time. Um, and this is a single logarithmic plot. So the logarithm of the area in micrometers squared is a function of time in hours. And a straight line would be an exponential growth in this plot. So if I take this experimental data, the red data points are wild type wing disks, the blue are GFP DPP wing disks. If I take a smooth curve as a fit, then a tangent to this curve is a growth rate. And therefore you see that the growth starts fast and gradually slows down. And maybe it eventually stops and goes to zero. Now, I define the area growth rate G units inverse time, which is the time derivative of area divided by area. And um, the solid lines, which are used as a fit here, correspond to a growth process where this area growth rate is not constant, but decreases systematically exponentially with time. So there is a growth rate G0 at time T0. Tor is a characteristic sort of relaxation time in a physical language over which some process relaxes to zero. And um, so this growth rate relaxes to zero. If I take now this relation for the growth law and I integrate this to determine how the area evolves in time, I get this expression. This is a somewhat complicated form. The area is the exponential of something, one minus the exponential of time. And this function is the fit function used here. And from this fit, one can determine 
the important parameter tau, which is the characteristic time over which the growth rate seems to decrease in this growth process. And this is for these disks about 30 hours. It's not a, this, this is sort of a new time that comes in in the kinetics of how growth changes with time. That's now sort of the phenomenon that we're trying to understand. We have a group of cells that grows and that stops growing, that stops growing at the right size. So this has to do with how does the system can determine its size. And also the question of how can many cells together grow in a coordinated and controlled way that doesn't, of course, you could say each cell has its own cell division rate and they just grow exponentially and the thing is completely uncontrolled until it dies. But here this has to be very controlled and slowed down gradually as a collection to find the right size. And the right size is the final size, which is well defined here. If you put t goes to infinity here, this exponential is zero and you get a well defined size a zero e to the g zero tau. That's the final size of this growth process. And um, the cells have to do that somehow. Of course, there are some hormones coming from the larvae to, to tell the, this what to do, in particular when transitioning from the growth phase here to the pupil phase. This is done by hormones that come from outside. But the growth phase itself must be coordinated between cells. And I think of this as a self-organized growth process where the decision of cells whether or not to divide and to grow comes from chemical signals. And I'd like to discuss now how this can be done and propose a mechanism that actually can produce exactly this behavior. Now, one important question is, is this growth process sort of homogeneously distributed in the tissue? Does every piece of tissue grow at the same rate, or are there pieces of tissue we grow faster than other pieces of tissue? That would be an inhomogeneous growth. And um, with Otto Wattlick some years ago, we looked at this by using phosphorohistone staining to see mitotic cells in fixed wing disks at different stages. And here you see wing disks at different stages. And you see all the little spot dots are cells that are just doing mitosis. These are spotty patterns. So it's a stochastic type of process, which cells divide. But more or less, it's spread evenly through the, through the disk. And here's a quantification of that. So this is, this is sort of consistent with the idea that the growth rate and the cell division rates are essentially constant everywhere. And the whole tissue grows equally everywhere. So we have to understand homogeneous growth, and we have to understand the growth rate that decays with time, and understand how this can be regulated by chemical signals. Also, more recently, we now have this these, uh, wing distant culture medium, where we can actually see cell divisions happen. We haven't really analyzed this in very much detail, but I would say roughly this is consistent with this homogeneous growth. You see cell divisions everywhere. And during this movie, every cell, cell divides about once. And you cannot see regions where there's more cell division than others. It's to first order is a homogeneous growth process. So I introduced yesterday compartment boundaries. And already mentioned that they are important organizers for the chemical signals and patterns that form in the imaginal disks as they grow. And they, they, this is also an, a key organizer for growth regulation. So I'll focus here on the AP boundary. And um, I explained yesterday how it can be maintained and established with the help of mechanical tension. What is now important is to realize that there are chemical differences on both sides. The posterior tissue expresses a molecule that spreads a morphogen called hedgehog, a very important signaling molecule. But the posterior tissue doesn't possess the receptor for hedgehog. And the posterior tissue does not activate the signaling pathway of hedgehog. The anterior tissue has the receptor and is sensitive to hedgehog ligand that spreads from the posterior side and activates hedgehog signaling in a region close to the compartment boundary where the cells first encounter the hedgehog molecules that come from the posterior side. So there's a narrow stripe of cells near the compartment boundary, but on the anterior side, which are different from the others. And in this narrow group of cells, one important gene is expressed, DPP or decapentaplegic, which is expressed in this narrow row of cells, is secreted, and which also spreads in the tissue. 
And DVP is considered to be a morphogen. The definition of a morphogen is that it is locally produced and secreted in certain regions and has signaling effects after moving through the tissue to, a, to cells at a distance from where it was secreted. So DVP has a maximum near this anterior posterior compartment boundary. It spreads in the tissue and it forms a graded concentration profile in the tissue. And it's a very important signaling molecule, so the name already hints at the fact that if it is perturbed or absent, there is a dramatic phenotype um, and the fly will not make it. Um, DVP is involved in tissue patterning, so many genes expressed in the disc are expressed in patterns, for example, to create later the vein patterns, there are gene expression patterns established early, and such uh, patterns depend on the DPP signal, and there are genes which are expressed in regions of high DPP levels and not in regions of low DPP, that is a whole zoology of, of um, patterns and genes that are known here. And DPP is evolved in the tissue patterning. But secondly, DPP is an important growth factor. It's known um, to be involved in growth control. And that's what I will focus on um, here today. So here you see a wing imaginal disc. This is the pouch region, um, which has a GFP DPP expressed. And the GFP signal is very strong in this region uh, at the, near the compartment boundary where this molecule is actually produced, but you find it everywhere in the tissue where no expression takes place, but you find a DPP that is emerging from this source region. And one can quantify the concentration gradient, or let's say the fluorescence gradient, using fluorescent microscopy, um, of DPP as a function of the distance from the source. And this is, can be well done, because if you're going to the, on, on this side here, the source is in the anterior tissue. And if you're looking at the posterior tissue, we can use the compartment boundary as a zero coordinate and then we measure distance from the zero coordinate. And, and, and plot the intensity as a function of disposition x, and the red data is the DPP signal after subtracting background. Question? No. And here I also use um, a fit to this profile, which is measured, which is an exponential function. And one can usually fit this profile very well with simple exponentials. Yeah, you, can, you, can, we can, you can argue whether this is a good fit or a bad fit, but one can fit them. And by fitting that, there is one parameter that is determined, that is a characteristic length, the distance over which this, this profile typically decays. And the red data is GF, DPP, GFP. I also show um, in blue a different uh, molecule, wingless, which we also quantified. Now, how, do we can, how can we sort of discuss such a graded concentration profile? And I will take, so for simplicity here, sort of continuum picture, not cell-based, which one could also do. And think of this as a molecule that is secreted locally, there's a source, and then it can spread, which essentially is an unbiased diffusion-like motion, but one should not think in terms of simple Brownian motion. It's really an effective diffusion that involves cellular processes, can involve cellular traffic and processes. Um, and then cell, it, is, it is binding to receptors on the cell surface. It can be internalized to cells. And typically, when it's inside the cells in endosomes, it can, active, it can um, trigger signaling activity, can have consequences on target genes. Um, and then it's taken out of the pool of molecules that spread in the tissue. So this looks like an effective loss. Or, of course, it's also, at the end, the molecules are in the cell are degraded. So effectively, there's a loss term in, the, in this equation. So we have a time dependence of this level is governed by a source, which is only non-zero in the small stripe where it's produced. There is a diffusion term because it can spread. If the tissue itself moves and there can be cell flows because of growth, then we also have a convection term, or it can also be dilution effects, and we, and, and, and we have a degradation term corresponding to molecules take, being taken out from this um, mobile pool. And um, now, if we look at the concrete case of DPP, we find the growth turns out to be quite slow as compared to the dynamics of the establishment of these profiles. And therefore, we typically neglect these terms. First, it sort of relaxes quickly to a quasi-steady state and 
convection is not very important. But of course, that's just a simplification for the discussion in general. One has to take these terms into account. Now, by neglecting this and thinking of it as a quasi-static, quasi-steady state governed by diffusion and degradation, um, this is a, now a differential equation for the profile, which can be solved. And this has exponential solutions. So that's also a reason why the exponential fit is a useful one, because it connects to this limit. And the decay length that one can measure here is in this model related to the ratio of the diffusion coefficient and the degradation rate. So this is an effective diffusion coefficient, tissue diffusion coefficient. Yeah? One has to be careful with the definition of what it exactly means. And this is sort of an effective degradation rate, um, which one can define in more complex cell-based models, which have a lot of trafficking process involved. And I don't want to go into these details here today. Yes? Uh, DPP is not a transcription factor, but DPP um, uh, triggers um, a signaling, a DPP signaling pathway. And the DPP sits in endosomes, can be recycled back to the cell surface, or it can go to, to a de to de degradation um, pathway. But in these endosomes, um, it can activate the DPP signaling pathway, which then brings transcription factors to the, to the nucleus. Yeah. Yeah. So effective diffusion is something which one can measure, and we have values for it. And it is what it is. But um, the point is, it is not the same as Brownian diffusion of a molecule in the cell, or even outside the cell. It's it's a. It's the apparent diffusion coefficient if you follow the molecule of a long distance over many cells. Yeah. Yes, they do respond, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure about exactly how the hedgehog system works here, but I suspect it's similar to what I'm doing here. There would be a diffusion and degradation term. You get a graded profile, and then you have a threshold, and it gives you a region where it is active. As I say, if you take such a model seriously, then you could also have a gradient of hedgehog. And then you have a threshold, and it sits of a finite size. But it's not the subject of my talk. And I don't know as much about this system as I know about this system. But that's, well, that's at least if you look at Hedgehog, you, you, you see it being graded, and you see only a stripe activity. But what exactly the mechanisms are, why it is in a stripe, I don't want to discuss here, because I, that's not the subject of my talk today. Um, let's see. OK. Um, so we have these concepts of this effective diffusion coefficient and effective degradation rate, and I could give a separate talk only about the subject, but that's not the subject. I don't want to go into more details today. Um, now I want to talk about growth control. And now the, the important sort of striking issue here is we have a system that grows self-organized homogeneously in space, as you see here in a chemically coordinated manner with the help of growth factors. But these growth factors are not at all spread homogeneously in the tissue. They are totally graded. So there's a huge concentration here, and then they're graded. So what, how, how can we make sense of a situation where growth factors are completely inhomogeneous, very strongly inhomogeneous, while growth is homogeneous? And can we use all these ingredients to build a system that does the right thing and that behaves as we see in the tissue. That's what I want, want to, to do now. And so the idea is, the question is, what are these mechanisms of self-organized growth control? And just to put it on context, there are a number of ideas in this context that we should discuss. So um, the early suggestions were that it's not the DPP levels that somehow stimulate growth because they're so inhomogeneous but that it's the slope of the profile 
And if you take a simple picture of a simple source and a simple sink somewhere else, you get a linear gradient profile. And then the slope is constant everywhere. So it's a simple picture that slopes may do the job. Then another important um, idea is by Lars Hufnagel and Boris Schreimann that mechanical stresses play an, an important role to homogenize growth. So the picture is that if you have locally cells starting to, to divide more or grow more quickly than elsewhere, you sort of build up local stress and pressure. And growing against pressure is suppressed physically, maybe also by uh, mechanosensing processes. And this sort of balances sort of the increase in growth by a mechanical feedback. One difficulty uh, with this idea as a general organ organizer of growth in the whole issue is that it sort of needs um, growth regulation, which is sort of, um, or, or growth that is sort of radially organized. And at the center, there is more growth than in the, in the periphery. And therefore, you build up more stress in the center. Well, if you have a line that organizes growth, you would not build such stresses if along the line things are constant and only in the second dimension you get inhomogeneities. So, so um, this is certainly an important component, but I want to propose a different idea. And of course, these ideas can also work together. They're, they don't, they're, not, they're not necessarily incompatible with each other, but one which is really based on using chemical signals alone they can already create homogeneous growth. And then you can think of such mechanical effects as an additional feedback to help smoothen fluctuations. So I want to propose a temporal rule rather than a spatial rule, temporal rule. That is sort of the time dependence of the DPP signal, which regulates growth and stimulates growth. And this can do the job without the need of mechanical feedback. There's a question. And then how fast do you grow? But then how fast do the cells? You, you can try to make a model. I would like to discuss that with you. But, but um, you have to control it. You have to regulate it. What you're describing is not really regulation. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so now to get to develop this idea, let me first start with a quantification of the DPP profiles over time as this imaginal disk grows inside the larvae. So that's work that was done by Otto Gwartlik in the lab of Marcos Gonzalez Gaitan. And here you see um, profiles of DPP in the um, wig imaginal disk at different times. You see the times here as a function of distance from the source. And they, they can all be fit by exponential functions. And there are two important things to notice. So one is, at the beginning, the amplitude, the levels are small. At the end, they are high, high levels. Furthermore, of course, the disks at the beginning are short. That's why they stop early. And later, the, the, the disks are, are larger, so they reach out further. But also, this decay length, the lambda that we use as a fit parameter here, increases with time. So the small disks have a small lambda. The large disks have a big lambda. That's why I call, say here this lambda of t. So as the tissue grows, somehow this decay length of the DPP profile increases. And as I mentioned, that this decay length, we may think of it being related to diffusion coefficient and degradation rate. Um, this implies that these things are dynamic quantities. Now. From this data, we find a remarkable property of the profiles that we call scaling. They have two different scaling properties. If we look at how they change as the tissue becomes larger, I mentioned already they increase in amplitude and they increase in reach. But both of these changes follow simple laws. If we look at how does the decay length, the length lambda, increase with the system size, we see there is a 
clear linear correlation. It's essentially proportional. As the tissue grows, the range over which this profile decays follows the growth. Secondly, the amplitude increases as the tissue size increases. Here I plot area of the tissue versus tissue size. And this is now a double logarithmic plot. And in the double logarithmic plot, I can fit it with a straight line. And a straight line in the double logarithmic plot is a power law. This means that the maximum level or the amplitude of my profile increases with the area to some power beta. And this power beta is about 0 0.6 in this tissue. And this is also what we call a scaling behavior. So this profile scales, whatever that means. I should also stress that a very simple-minded way to understand such a scaling would be that the tissue grows and that the, the profile is just stretched with the growing tissue. That would be one mechanism to get such a linear relationship between decay length and size. However, in such a scenario, if that was the case, the concentration would go down because you have to keep the same molecules in your distribution. And as the system locally grows, the same number of molecules is now distributed over a larger area. So the concentration is diluted and goes down. We see the contrary. The concentration goes up. So there's a, there's a non-trivial process here taking place. And it goes up in a well-defined power law. For the moment, it's just a phenomenological observation. It's not a growth rate. No, it's, it just means that if you double the area and doing growth, C0 goes up by 2 to the beta. That's what it means. Yes? X increases, as the size of the tissue increases as the tissue grows. So the, the maximal length of which the gradient is measured increases with time. If that was your question. Yes? This we don't know yet. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss it later. For the moment, I'll just tell you what we see, not yet how it's interpreted. Yes? Fixed experiments averaged over many disks. Do you see? Because life, yeah, it's, it's only very recent that one can culture these disks. And it's, this, this work was really done in fixed um, disks. At that time, the only way to do it was to take them out. But also these current cultured experiments, they behave differently than in vivo. So it's better to use real disks that grew in a real real larvae. OK, so we have this scaling behavior. Now, um, by using sort of these exponential fits, I may have biased the analysis. So I want to show you now that this scaling is independent of whether my fit function is a good fit function or not. Yeah, and for that, we can just normalize these profiles. So I, I define a relative position relative to the length L up to the margin of the tissue, R, which goes from 0 to 1. And I normalize also the amplitude with the concentration at x equals 0. And then I can superimpose at different sizes these profiles. And, and um, I get sort of a characteristic average profile. And, when, and another way to do that is to sort of superimpose all these curves and bin them according to how often a curve passes through a little grid element, and then make a histogram of this accumulation of curves. And you see they superimpose on one master curve, even though they belong to very different um, system sizes. And in this case, we now define um, a, a function f of r, which starts from 1, which goes to um, um, which starts with f equals 1 at 0 and goes to r equals 1 and is characterizing the invariant shape of the profile as this tissue grows. And then the actual profile can be sort of determined by multiplying this with a time-dependent amplitude by taking into account that the tissue grows. And 
So we have the idea here that profile does not change with the increasing tissue shortening size. The amplitude changes, and it's stretched with growth. <coughs> now, now we come to questions about what, what is going on here. Um, I mentioned before that this lambda, we think of it as a ratio of a, an effective diffusion coefficient and an effective degradation rate, both of which are not, not, um, properties one can measure, but which result from complex cell biological processes involving intracellular trafficking. Don't want to go into this, but the cell can regulate and change those quantities. And one can try to see what changes when lambda changes during growth. And here we estimate using FRAP experiments um, this effective degradation rate as a function of tissue area. We've also found from our work that the effective diffusion coefficient seems to vary little, while the effective degradation rate varies a lot. And um, the suggestion here is that the effective degradation rate decreases as the tissue becomes larger. Therefore, as the tissue is larger, molecules have a longer lifetime. And even if you have a constant source secretion rate, you still increase the levels. And that would explain both things. It could explain why the overall amplitude increases, because the degradation rate is decreased as the, the tissue becomes larger. And it explains why the lambda um, goes up. And if k behaves like 1 over l squared, as this data suggests, lambda is proportional to l. So our interpretation here is that somehow the degradation rate of DPP varies with time. It's probably regulated itself in order to achieve scaling of this profile. And um, therefore, we get this phenomena which I sh showed you. Now, this now raises the big question of what regulates the degradation rate and how and why. Yes? Here, I don't have a beta on this slide. The increase. I didn't say it explains the exponent. For the exponent, you need a full self-controlled. Um, for me, it's a full, full system, everything together. Um, but now this raises the big question of um, what regulates and how is this degradation rate regulated. And that's the subject um, of the scaling mechanism, which I don't really want to go into in my talk today. It's also a subject which is not yet fully resolved. Um, there are some very important ideas. I just want to highlight Nama Barkai's work. So she has proposed a system of regulation of the degradation rate by a molecule that she called an expander. And she called this whole process an expansion repression feedback. The second molecule is sort of not known exactly what it is. It spreads in the tissue. And in, in her expansion repression feedback model, the expander has a second equation similar to the first one for the DPP. The second equation with a source and the diffusion and degradation is considered to be typically long-lived. It is produced at regions where DPP is low. Sort of when, it, when the gradient dies out too quickly, there's a large region where this expander is produced. It diffuses in the tissue. And the degradation rate is suppressed by the expander. And then you get a feedback system, which has the features that it can do something that looks very much like scaling. So that system is, an, is, an, is a proposal for how the scaling could work. Um, independently of this work, in collaboration with Marcos, we, we also proposed a regulation mechanism that can achieve scaling. Um, we also introduced a molecule that regulates degradation. So let's call it expander. In our original version, uh, it was a long-lived molecule um, that, that was present and didn't need to be secreted all the time. And essentially, as the tissue grew, it was just um, diluted. And therefore, the concentration decreases. The concentration decreases like 1 over L square if the tissue is an, um, has an area L square. And if now this degradation rate is proportional to the expander molecule, imagine that each expander molecule is needed to, to degrade a DPP molecule, then you get such a law. And then you get exactly what you need. K goes like 1 over L square, and the thing scales beautifully. 
So still, so these are two possibilities. I don't want to. I, I think both of them don't don't really explain what's actually going on. But but it, these are good ideas to to follow up. Um, Nama Baka also pointed out that a molecule called Pentagon might be an interesting candidate for this expander, even though I'm, I'm not sure this is really definite, but it's, a, it's an important idea. So Pentagon is a molecule that somehow controls TPP signaling, is spread and secreted in the tissue, so has, has many of the properties that an expander molecule should have. Uh, the name comes from the fact that in a Pentagon mutant, you're lacking one vein, which is a bit surprising phenotype in the context of this discussion, but it clearly affects the DPP profile and can regulate the behavior of DPP in a tissue and, and uh, DPP signaling. But I should say we still don't really know how this expander system works. I don't want to go deeper into the subject. Let's for now on just suppose there is a beautiful expander system at work which makes this gradient scale as the tissue grows and take the consequences of that. Now, what is the implication or purpose of scaling? First, it's somehow an obvious sort of idea when you see that these profiles scale as the tissue grows, and they scale in a non-trivial way. As I said, this cannot be explained simply by the growth itself. There must be something on top that regulates this as the tissue grows. Um, this hints at this being a sort of a part of this general um, system that is able to generate scalable patterns. Yeah? This is a system that, in, for example, in many different fly species is at work and creates wing patterns and wings and structures at different sizes. So th this, these developmental systems must intrinsically be able to create scalable patterns. And of course, having scalable morphogen signals could be important for that. Secondly, I'd like to show you that this scaling naturally provides a simple growth control system. So we, if the system scales, as I'll show you, it can be used for growth control in a very simple way. And to get at that, let's first look at one interesting quantity, which will become important. So if I define a DPP level at position R at time t, um, I can also look at how does it depend on time, when the system grows and evolves in time. Now, because the system and the profile is just rescaled during growth, the time dependence essentially only comes from the prefactor. So the time dependence the, that we find in the local region of the tissue, if we move with the growing tissue, um, sort of constant R, is coming from the change in amplitude. Of course, it's modulated by the shape of the profile. But if rather than looking at the absolute time dependence, we're looking at the relative rate of change. If we divide, if we, if we ask what is the relative rate of change given the levels that we're having, Sort of the, what is the percentage change of the concentration per unit time? This ratio uh, is independent of position. It's everywhere the cell in the, in the tissue. And that's a signal that can be detected everywhere in the signal, in the, in the tissue, and it's the same everywhere. So this could be used to control homogeneous growth, even though the signal itself has a spatial profile. <coughs> Now, what does this signal look like? If we now take our measurement of the amplitude C0 as a function of area, we can ask, how does this signal behave? And in fact, if I have this power law, which I introduced before, and I now calculate it C dot divided by C, the relative rate of change, using this power law, I find that it's the same as beta times A dot over A. Beta is the slope of this curve, and A dot over A is the growth rate. Now, this is a correlation. This shows us that this signal, which is available everywhere in the tissue and has the same value everywhere, even though the signal carrying molecule comes in a gradient, is exactly, is exactly proportional to the growth rate. And that's the thing that we want to control. So from this correlation, from this observation, we came to the suggestion as a hypothesis that the causality may be such that C dot over C actually controls growth. The correlation comes from the fact that there's co growth control at this level implemented. What this means is that the DPP signaling system, when it's activated, it's a very complex um, signaling process involving gene expression, coupling to many, many um, systems in the cell. 
effectively measures the relative rate of change of a signal and as an output after this complex black box has done its work, generates cell growth that is proportional to C dot over C. And the Covision beta then describes a property of this whole growth control process in the cell that I don't understand in detail, I treat it as a black box. It measures the relative rate of change as an input, it produces growth at the output, and it has this property. Beta is a, is, is a parameter describing this, this system. And this is a this level of hypothesis. This can explain this curve, but we have to find out whether this is actually true, whether this is the mechanism that was work. Let's first use theory and try to understand whether it can work. That's if we implement that, does it do the right thing? First, I'd like to comment on why would a signaling system measure C dot over C. That sounds at first a little bit surprising or unusual, but the opposite is true. It's the most natural thing a signal system would measure. And that's what I'd like to explain to you. In fact, measuring C dot over C essentially means that you're having an adaptive sensor, a system that does not measure absolute levels, but adapts its sensitivity to the actual levels. That's, for example, what all signaling systems have to do. Uh, sorry, all sensory systems have to do. Your eyes, your ears, all senses are adaptive sensors. They detect not absolute values, but relative changes, and therefore they can operate over large ranges. If you have a very dim signal, you may have to be much more sensitive. You need, your eyes become more sensitive to, to in the dark because you want to see very small differences. If you have sunlight, your eye becomes very insensitive. The same thing is also true in chemotaxis. You see very clearly, it only works if you, if you measure chemicals in a, in, a, in a sensory system which is adaptive. The olfactory system is adaptive. It's also chemi chemical sense. And we propose that all these, these sensory systems that cells possess to detect incoming signals from their neighbors during development must also be adaptive systems in order to be able to operate over large ranges of concentration. And the idea that systems detect relative changes was also stressed in um, other papers, in particular Uli Allen has termed fault change detection as the term that describes the measurement of such a relative change. Um, also in the context of chemotaxis, um, Barkay and Leibler have done seminal work to dis discuss how such adaptive systems can be constructed. And we can do that very easily with simple feedbacks. One can make can build a sensor that is adaptive and has the property that its output uh, measures essentially C dot C. Of course, cells don't take real time derivatives, and it also doesn't make a real sense. What in practice happens, the sensor has an inter internal measurement time, let's call it tau, and then it measures the relative change during the time tau. And this is then a, a coarse-grained version of this time derivative, which essentially does the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so with this, I have established that it's the most natural thing for a cell to detect relative rates of change. That's the best thing it can do. If it does it, and if it now uses that information to regulate growth, then we are in this system that I'm describing that is supported by, by this data. Now let's, just a couple of comments. Of course, this law cannot work for arbitrary large signals. There's a maximal growth rate the cell cannot go faster at, so in practice, the growth rate will be cut off at a maximum rate. So for small signals, there may be a linear um, increase, and at some point, it has to, has to saturate. And now, if we have now such a law, uh, we can think of what's happening. So we have a system that grows. Because it grows, the gradient has to be rescaled of DPP. Because the gradient is rescaled by reduction of degradation rate, Molecules have a longer lifetime. The DPP profile builds up because the source brings in more molecules. And this increase of the DPP profile, in particular EC not going up, now triggers a wave of growth. And this growth now completes this circle. And now we have a system that self-organized, that self-organized growth. Each wave of growth triggers a new wave of growth, of course, in a continuous manner. And in the end, it has to happen in a way where the growth rate slowly decays until the system has reached its, its correct size. If each wave of growth increases a bigger wave of growth, then you're in trouble, the system would blow up. So this has to be, has to be in the right operating range. Now tr let's try out these ideas with a type of concept I also introduced yesterday. Let's build a system on a, as a model 
that has all the ingredients, only local interaction rules, very simple rules, and let's see if the system does the right thing. So we take a vertex model, where I shown you yesterday that it, that it can grow. But now, rather than what I did yesterday, where the growth was completely stochastic, I now want to control it 100% with molecular concentrations with DPP. So each cell has now a DPP concentration. I is a cell index. This DPP concentration can have a source term if the cell happens to be under the compartment boundary. It has a degradation term. The diffusion is described by exchange between cell neighbors. So now discrete diffusion model. You know, when there's a, if there's a level difference between neighboring cells, there is a diffusion flux, and it defines a diffusion coefficient. I also, we also build in our model the hedgehog system. We, put in, we start from two compartments. You also saw the simulation yesterday with two compartments with a compartment boundary that is maintained with extra, extra tension. Now, we have a hedgehog level. Yes, thank you. There's a typo here. The hedgehog system. Um, has, has source in the whole compartment where it's produced. Um, there's also degradation to get the gradient that we I talked about yet, um, that we mentioned earlier, so one can speculate a model for the hedgehog system here. Then whenever the hedgehog levels are beyond some threshold in the right compartment, the source is switched on. We need a gradient that scales, that's important. So we need to control the degradation rate. And we do that with an expander that is not produced because it's there from the beginning. It's just diluted. That's the dilution process. So it diffuses and is diluted whenever the cell divides. And then the only remaining ingredient is the things that should grow. So we say the, the cells grow. The preferred area of the cell that I introduced yesterday is time dependent. And the growth rate is proportional to C dot over C by this, by this growth law. And C dot over C, we, we have available in our calculation as well, because we know what C dot is, we know what C is. Now, whenever the cell has grown to twice its initial size, then we divide it, and we give it a random cell division orientation. And let's try, of course, all these ideas that I presented, should, this should work, but we are not sure if it really works. We have fluctuations and mechanics and so on, so let's try it out. So here we, I should first show you the cell divisions. We start from a small piece of tissue. There's a compartment boundary here. We have a growth rate, a growth law. We have cell divisions when cell area is doubled. We have an expanded dilution scaling. And let's look at what happens. It actually grows in a beautiful way, homogeneous growth. Growth cell divisions are stochastic for interesting reasons, um, even though the whole process is deterministic, the way this is set up. But it has to do with the irregularities of the the network, you see the compartment boundary. Growth slows down with time. The red cells are the ones that divide, and growth until it stops. That's what a system does. I can now show you the underlying signals that produced what, what you just saw here in the simulation. Here you now see the two compartments, posterior and anterior. Yes. There are some, yeah, as I showed you yesterday, the, that's taken care of by my energy function, yes. Yeah. There's no contradiction because it's an active system. It uses food to be able to perform work. Yeah, that's what's described by the mechanical model, of course. But of course, it's a non-equilibrium active system, which can produce forces. That was my whole, whole point at the beginning of the lecture. We can discuss it later. Mm -hmm. So we have a posterior department. We have an anterior department, compartment. We have a compartment boundary. We have hedgehog in blue. We have DPP in, in green. So here you see first the system viewed by its compartment boundaries. Then we switch to show real. The hedgehog is only secreted here. Then we have a gradient because of degradation. And the dots here are those cells which are above the hedgehog threshold and which will secrete DPP. And now you see the DPP signal. DPP is produced where these dots are, and it spreads on both sides. And this, with the expander, it does scale. Yeah? Therefore, this whole profile stretches as this grows. And if we now 
take this model and we plot the area as a function of time, we have this red curve. And the black dots are the growth curves, it's actually the same data I showed you at the beginning, for the wing growth. Yeah, so we can, by just putting beta equals 0, um, 0.6 in our growth rule, we can fully account for this growth curve. And this was very promising, and we found this quite exciting. Next thing we did, we also looked at a second organ that's uh, called a haltier. And the haltier grows from what is called a haltier disc. It is some, some sort of a little winglet. It doesn't have the role of a, of a real wing, but it's used in flight for stabilization by the fly. It's much, much smaller than the, the real wing, but it, it grows by the same principles and the same. It's a very similar disc. Here you see the growth of the haltier disc, and it can be described by the same model, but slightly changed initial conditions, which depend on the fact that the haltier disc starts out slightly differently. So this model can account for the growth process fully that we, that we observe. Now, so far, I've only shown you that we have a model that can explain the data, and if, if put sort of at work in a simulation, actually works, is stable and works. It doesn't prove that the correlations we see in the data follow from the causality of this model. Now, one next step, sort of because we were sort of um, intrigued by this, but we were not sure that whether this is actually the right mechanism, we were wondering whether there are tests that are very strong, where we have a situation where the same components are at work, but the timing and the time dependence is completely different, and whether we can still use the same arguments. And for that purpose, we looked at the i-imaginal disk, which is the disk which is important for the fly eye. And the i-imaginal disk um, also has a boundary between an anterior and a posterior region. But rather than being stationary, as in the wing disc, it, is, it moves. It propagates through the tissue. And it leaves in its wake a tissue which then generates this hexagonal lattice of Amatidia. And it moves at a certain velocity. So as a consequence, as there is also a DPP source at this furrow that moves through the tissue, we have now a moving gradient. And this is a completely different spatiotemporal process. So let's see whether, in this system, our idea still works. And that's a very strong test of the idea. So here, the sketch again, we have the posterior and anterior compartment. We have a furrow, a morphogenetic furrow, which moves at a velocity vs. In its wake, there's the formation of Amatidia. I will not talk about this at all. I'm interested in the tissue here in front, the anterior tissue, into which this furrow moves. This is the tissue which actually grows and where cell divisions take place, and we want to understand those. So here you see a cultured eye disc. This is the furrow. These are the forming omatidia. This is the side of tissue we're interested in. The DPP source is along this furrow. This furrow moves at about three micrometers per hour. This is now the movie. It runs. And in front of this moving furrow, we have lots of cell divisions here. Now the question is, is this growth and division process in this interior tissue, driven by TPP? And if yes, is it driven by the same rules that we identified in the wing? There are some divisions on the left side. They're not TPP driven. And they're not contributing to growth, but subdividing the tissue. No, in the wing, no. under the conditions of the wing. I'll explain later, then we can talk about it. Because using the same model now here changes many things. And the question is, does it change things in the way they actually happen? Let's first look at what goes on. So we, have a, we can measure the anterior distance LA and the posterior distance LP. And here you see the time depends as a function of so posterior is shown in black. Now, as this thing moves at constant velocity through the tissue, and there's essentially no growth here, the posterior size just increases linearly with time. And the slope of this curve is the measured velocity of the furrow that moves through the tissue. 
the posterior tissue is just increased linearly as the furrow moves. That's this slope here. The anterior tissue is more complex. Because the furrow moves, it's sort of eaten up by the incoming furrow and it decreases. But at the same time, there's a lot of growth there, which makes it increase. So initially, growth wins because it's quite large. There's other, yeah, it's growth wins. And finally, the furrow wins. And there's a region where the size is approximately constant, which is also a useful region to look at because then things are simpler to study. <clears throat> so the LPDT, the posterior width, is just Vs times T. And the anterior width is now this combination of growth and the moving furrow. So what matters here is the growth along the x-axis. Um, integrating the growth rate gives us an overall length gain. And we have to subtract the furrow velocity. And this then creates this red curve. Now let's discuss wing versus, versus eye. In the wing disc, we have a fixed source. And we have a profile which scales as the tissue grows because of size scaling. Now, with this growth law, um, we get a profile that in a rescaled system increases in amplitude, and we get homogeneous growth everywhere in the tissue. If we now apply the same idea to the eye disk, and let's take for simplicity the case where the size of the tissue is more or less constant, and we have to, don't have to worry about scaling. The simplest picture is that this thing is just translated through the tissue space because of the velocity Vs. And so this is homogeneous growth. Now, from this configuration, we go to a shifted configuration, which means now that in front of the furrow, levels go up with a maximum further away, and then go down again. And in the back of the furrow, they go down. So if the system it stimulates growth with a um, relative rate of change increasing the level, growth will be driven in the front, but not in the back. And it will be driven in a spatially inhomogeneous wave that has a maximum at a certain distance from, from, from the origin. Yeah. Now the question is, is that what's happening? And can we account for what's happening? That's the prediction of the, of, of the model. And as we can now quantify, and we can test it and see what it works. So I'm not talking about the back. I'm not talking about the back. Okay. I'm just saying this model explains why there's no DPP-dependent division happening. Okay. But other pathways can still regulate division. And, but they are out of my game. Okay. But I'm talking about the front. But there's a big asymmetry between back and front. That's what I would emphasize. You can, the DPP effect can be switched off in the back while it's completely active in the front with this mechanism that we propose, which explains that this thing can do its own game completely separate from this tissue. Now we can sort of collect information. We have a, you know, interested in the, what a cell receives, a local level C cell of T, of DPP. And now the profile for simplicity, I say it's just translated. So it's the, there's a time-independent profile, C of x, but I have to look at it at position x cell. And x cell is measured relative to the position of the furrow, because where the furrow is is my maximum of my profile. Now, C cell of t now depends on the dynamics of this tissue. C cell of t comes from the growth-induced contribution to the velocity and to the furrow-induced contribution. I showed that here. No. There's these two contributions to the tissue dynamics. <clears throat> and sort of we have to plug that in here. And now we can calculate what is the local C dot over C signal that the cell receives in the spirit of what I explained before. And you see, if I take the derivative with respect to time of C cell of T, I have to first take the space derivative dc dx and then multiply with dx dt. So dc, d, dc dx is this gradient here. And d cell, dx dt is this factor. And if I now div divide by c cell, this just gives me a c. So this is now a relationship calculating the local c dot over c. Now, 
we propose that this signal drives local growth. By our law that G, the area growth rate, is beta minus 1 C dot C cell over C cell. Now, first I like to mention that it's related to what I just said before. The local growth rate changes, creates a gradient of this growth velocity. The relationship in the growth velocity Vg and the local growth rate in x direction is just this gradient. Furthermore, the full growth rate, which we generate here, is the sum of growth rate in x and in y direction. And we introduce here an anisot growth anisotropy parameter, which tells us how strong the y growth is compared to the x growth. That's something we can measure. Epsilon is this growth as an anisotropy. And if epsilon is 1, it's isotropic. Epsilon 0 is completely anisotropic. Yeah. And it's, a, it's near 1 if you do the measurement. So g is 2 times gx. Now we can plug this together. Yeah. Um, we put this expression for gx in here. We put this expression for g in here. And then we can equal those two things. Yeah. And we can we first write, write C dot cell over C cell is now a factor combining beta and 1 plus epsilon with the gradient of Vg. We then use a new coefficient gamma, which is our beta times 1 plus epsilon, which now depends on the growth and isotropy. And now we can, this must be the same as that. So we get an equation which turns out to be a differential equation in space for the growth pattern. Yeah? So given the profile of DPP, which is time independent but moves through the tissue, given the velocity at which this, this profile moves through the tissue, we can now calculate the spatial dependence of growth. If you know what Vg of x is, we can, we can calculate um, G of x also. We have everything. Yeah? This allows us to calculate the position-dependent growth profile as a solution of a differential equation. And this differential equation can be solved. Is quite nice, and compared to experiments. So that's the solution to the differential equation. There is a growth rate that, can, that is minus Vs, that's the velocity of the furrow, and then the space derivative of the normalized DPP profile to a power gamma, where gamma is this combination of our growth control coefficient and the growth anisotropy. Now, this can be tested experimentally. So in this eye disk, we measure a proxy for C of x. It turns out to be most convenient with many experiments to measure a DPP signaling profile using a, in this case, it's, it's a PMAT. That's a, that's a um, phosphorylated matter. A matter is a transcription factor that's triggered by the DPP signal. And that's here shown in black. So that's something similar to the DPP growth curves that I showed you before. It's a different proxy for the same type of information. And we fit a smooth curve to it in order to be able to plug it into this, into this function and calculate gx. Yeah, so we take, we take the experimental data. We fit a smooth function. We calculate this, and we know everything on, on, on this equation. We know what gamma is. We know what vs is. We calculate g of x. And what we get is the dashed blue line. And we can also measure g of x in the experiment by counting cell divisions and, and looking at growth. And we get the red data points. Now, you see the two are quite similar. It's remarkably similar. The main difference is a little shift in time. If we slightly shift the blue curve to the left, then we actually can account completely for the data. And what this means is there's a time delay between the signal and the event of growth. And we can measure this time delay by using this shift as a fit parameter. This essentially means it takes one hour between the C dot C signal has arrived at the cells and the growth to be, outcome to be effective. That's the shift. And now we can account for this curve. I should say we did the fit only up to here, and we didn't, we didn't take seriously this end piece. But if you look at this, this piece of data which deviates from the smooth function is consistent with the deviation down here. It seems, even seems to work in these places here, even though we didn't actually do it because the data is not reliable there. 
Now, this also works after we manipulate things. And um, I don't want to go in all details, but we can manipulate the, uh, the system. And, and, we all, um, and as long as we're going to break it completely, this, this works. For example, here, I'm looking at a pentagon mutant. The pentagon mutant, as I showed you before, has a, it has a scaling phenotype in the wing disk. It also has one in the eye, as I'll show you in a moment. It changes um, the profile of the PMAT as it would also do in the wing disk, it changes the, the gradient of DPP. And if you use, use this changed profile of PMAT now as an input, use our same model, we can fully account for the experimentally observed growth profile in this mutant if we adjust the delay from one hour to 1.4 hours. I should mention that we can also study scaling in the eye disk. There is scaling in the wild type, so we, if we in the wild type, if we plot um, different profiles on top of each other and we, we scale them, um, taking into account sort of the varying size LA, which doesn't vary very much, but it's enough to reveal that when we, in the wild type, they all overlap, and in the pentagon mutant, they don't overlap anymore. And the pentagon mutant has a scaling mutant similar to the wing as well. And then maybe one other example, but I don't want to put too many, but you find them in the paper. Um, we can even go to extremes and expressing DPP sort of brutally, essentially everywhere um, in this compartment. And it still works. Now, naively, one would think by expressing it everywhere, it gets a completely flat profile. It's not really true. When it gets a profile that has still a maximum here, but it doesn't go down, it, it stays finite because there's expression now everywhere of DPP. This model predicts the blue or this red curve. The red data points are the data. This account for this dramatic, quantitatively can account only for this dramatic perturbation of the system. And there's now a significantly higher delay for reasons we don't understand. But this model can explain all of this. And it was constructed in conditions of the fly wing, which were totally different. So for us, this is extremely strong evidence that this is actually what controls growth in these disks. So, so in the in the model I showed you be, in the model I showed you before, the model was that the C dot C drive cell growth and division happens when the cell size goes through a threshold. In our experiments, we can measure cell sizes and we can measure division rates, and we use the and we can measure tissue lengths, and we use those to deduce the growth profile, the area growth profile. So you think the delay is just the time to you know, no, the, the, the delay, we sort of, I treated all of the complex signaling process from the DPP pathway to the growth output, to the fact that somehow material is produced to make more proteins in the cell and ribosomes are activated and what is needed to, to, to actually grow. Um, this whole system we treat as a black box. is characterized by one parameter, beta, which describes how C.C .C drives growth and by one delay parameter, which tells how long it takes to get from input to the output. That's the, we describe the whole system by two parameters without explaining exactly how these two parameters are created in this very complex system. The next step would be to really understand this whole signaling system and see what times, internal times, give rise to these deltas and, and betas. We're just saying we need that two important properties of this whole huge signaling process from DPP to growth. They can be described by beta, which tells me how sensitive growth response to changes in relative changes in DPP level and how long it takes for this response to, to appear after the input. It's un unimportant. But it's just, it's just a choice for our vertex model simulation. In our vertex model, we use different versions. It's completely unimportant. We, we first started with models where the timing of cell division was regulated by DPP, not the growth rate. And the growth was always set by the division rate. These details are not resolved by what I'm explaining. You, you could implement what I'm saying in, in very small variants, and it still follows the same principles. 
and it, it de demands a lot of data to exactly figure out which variant is at work. Yeah. But the point is, this is a very general principle that is rigorous and robust and can work in a number of variants. Uh, the, the principle would be the main, would be the same. No, I don't assume anything of this type. Um, in one version of the vertex model, which I use for illustrative purposes, I use the idea that a C dot C drive cell growth and cell division follows when the cell reaches a certain size. On the general level, I only say tissue grows, the area growth of the tissue is linked to C dot C. How it's implemented in detail, I don't, don't discuss here. Whether cell division drives growth or the growth drives division, I don't comment on here. It's not necessary to, to know this for the principle I'm discussing. Okay, so that's, um, there's a few minutes left. Um, but I wanted to discuss a few things. So first example was how can we use a feedback loop between growth factors and um, cell division and cell growth to self-organize growth of the tissue. And the second example I want to give in this, this lecture it's to discuss, discuss a little bit planar cell polarity. There are 15 minutes or so left, is that right? 20. So I will use the remaining minutes to give you a brief introduction to cell polarity as a second important system that we've been very interested in to discuss how chemical signals organize the tissue, an epithelial tissue. And um, we are staying with the fly wing going back from the eye to the wing in another very far distance. And I introduced you this epithelium, which has a network of adherence junctions close to the epithelial surface. And this is related to the fact that individual cells are polarized perpendicular to the epithelial plane. There's an epical side and there's a basal side. It just means that this tissue has two different sides. What I now want to talk about is a different polarity, a polarity in addition to the simple epical basal polarity, namely an asymmetry of cell sides in the plane of the tissue. That's called planar cell polarity. And that's a very important concept and system to guide morphogenic processes. In particular, we have to understand not only how tissue size arises, which I was sort of alluding to in my last, last part of my growth control, but also how shape arises. And shape has to do with anisotropies and about doing things different along one axis than along another axis. And for that one needs planar cell polarity. And one um, obvious sort of um, signature of planar cell polarity in the fly wing is the fact that on the adult fly wing, they are so-called wing hairs. So if we zoom into this wing, we see each cell grows a little hair. And these hairs form a beautifully aligned pattern. They come from a point, and they move in a certain direction, and hairs from neighboring cells are almost aligned. And overall, there's a beautiful pattern of hair alignments. And here we quantified the local directions of these hairs in the whole adult fly wing. There's a beautiful long-range pattern. It's anisotropic and defines the direction in the, in the plane of the tissue. And this wing hair polarity is guided by a system of proteins that are called core planar cell polarity proteins. I will, I will allude to two different types of pol polarity systems. And this one I call core PCP system. PCP stands for planar cell polarity. And this system guides orientation of features in many cases. For example, um, fly wing hairs, which I just mentioned. And if you have mutants of such proteins, that are related to this PCP system, you can get new um, phenotypes of these orientations. The same system also guides the fur pattern of mammals. And here's a mutant of such proteins in the mouse, and you get a fur pattern mutant. And it also guides, for example, the orientation of mechanosensory hair cells in the ear, which are nicely oriented and get misoriented in the if the same types of proteins are mutated. And here you see the, the list of proteins, there are lots of them, which somehow work together. The blue and red form together one system. And uh, I distinguish them in blue and red because some of them 
fall on the, the proximal side of the cell and some form of the distal side of the cell. And this is schematically shown here. These proteins assemble near the cell membrane, near all these junctions. Um, and the blue ones assemble on the, towards the proximal direction, the, the red one towards the distal direction. But they interact across um, these membranes between neighboring cells. So they form actually, um, um, so, so schematically, schematically shown here, and this flamingo exists on both sides. These are sort of the two membranes. And you see some of these, they form links across from one cell to the other. Um, um, and then there are others which are grouped together. They form a comp complex of many molecules together, which have a typical orientation from one cell to the other. And this defines polarity. And then the picture is that if you look at two neighboring cells, the blue and the red groups of proteins, they would bind to each other across the membrane and form big complexes. While within a the cell, they would stay as far as possible from each other. That's why they sort of segregate within a cell and bind across the membrane. Pardon? All the feedback. This is maybe not a good symbol here if you think of it as a real feedback. It's not a feedback. This is just a repulsion. It just means they segregate. I'm just describing something here in words. There's not mathematics here. I'm saying that these molecules accumulate on a the membrane. They bind across here, and they somehow stay apart within a cell. That's the observation. And there are lots of ideas and models about how this could work. I don't want to go into here into the cellular details. I want to go into how this can be used to organize tissues. I should mention, but it will not be, I will not have much time to go into this. Um, there is a second important PCP system that we've also investigated. Um, while we call this the core PCP system, this one is based on two proteins called fat adduxes, and this, we can call it fat adduxes PCP system. Fat adduxes are two Caterin type molecules, which are unconventional. They form adhesive links between cells, which can be polar, which are different, um, um, can polarized. And here's sort of the scheme. So one can, one can have a situation where um, these links are typically oriented. And this is thought to be guided also by gradients of both of duxes and by another um, molecule called four jointed. But I don't want to go into details here. The idea here is that this is a polarity system which may be guided by concentration gradients, by expression gradients. But um, I don't think I've come today to the point where this becomes relevant. Just to tell you that two different systems, I will focus now on the core system. And the first thing that we were interested in is to measure the patterns of this polarity during development to understand how it emerges in the tissue during the um, dimensional disk growth and in the pupil phase, in order to, at the end, give rise to a pattern that guides the wing hairs in the adult. To do that, we're using GFP or YFP labeled versions of individual PCP proteins that's done in Suzanne Eaton's lab. And you see here, for example, the image where the fluorescence intensity can be seen in the cell contours. It's now a, not an, as nice image as the usual e cartierin that we usually use. It's sort of a little bit more spotty image. But it can be analyzed in terms of anisotropies. Now, the difficulty is the system is polar. It creates a vectorial axis. But because these molecules sit very close to each other on cell bonds, the fluorescence signal doesn't distinguish whether a, we on the on the side of the left cell or are we on the, on the bond of the right cell? So what we actually see is intensity um, that loses the vectorial information. But we can still pick out an axis. We don't know where the vector points to, but we can define an axis. And such an axis is what is called in liquid crystal and physics a nematic. It's, it's just an axis. It's not a vector, but a, but a nematic is a vector without axis. And it can be in two dimensions described by a two by two matrix where the sum of the, di the diagonal elements is zero. And it's symmetric. So a matrix which is symmetric and has sum of the zero diagonals is characterized by two numbers, 
a vector two dimensional would also be two components. So it has also two numbers, but it's as a as matrix, it defines not a vector with a pointing end, but just an axis. And to define now these components, one can sort of look at anisotropies around the cell. This, by integrating the intensity that is measured over the angle, one can define the, these two numbers. And this, this now defines an axis, which we can represent by a little yellow bar. And the length of the bar tells you how anisotropic this distribution is. And you see that even though by eye, you wouldn't pick out the planar polarity axis in this fluorescence image. By doing this quantitative analysis, you see there is a, there's an axis here. There is global order in this PCP distribution, not at least order within this little image. Now, we can also get information about the vector where it points to. That is a little bit more tricky. What one does here is to express clones in the tissue which lack the GFP, which don't express the GFP protein. And then the boundaries of these clones, one can actually know that the fluorescence comes from one side and not the other side. And so by integrating around the clone boundary, the intensities, we can extract a vector. But this is now the, the, the polarity vector for the whole clone. It's not a single cell property, it's a clone property. But of course, then the idea is getting both pieces of information, the individual nematics, the axis for the individual cells, which we can also average in small groups, and getting the information about the vectors of clones, we can construct the polarity picture in the tissue. And this we can, we can do at different times um, in the wing imaginal disk. Um, and we can watch how polarity emerges and then how it is organized later in time. And here we see a very early pattern. This is a very early disk. And we have lots of little arrows. These are little vector arrows that we can measure. And they're quite disordered. But there is local cell polarity in the plane already established. But it's not yet organized in a pattern. It's disordered. And then at later times, we get a beautifully organized cell polarity pattern. Now, we also can also discuss how can such order emerge if we start from a disordered system going to an ordered system. And for that, we can go back. Here, again, you see the uh, scheme of what this order looks like at later times. And this, this is some, some data, the nematics and the, the vectors. But let's now discuss some um, simple physical ideas about how such order can be established. And again, I use the vertex models that I've introduced yesterday. Now, we, we start with the vertex model, and we complement in the vertex model um, additional variables that capture PCP levels on cell bonds. So each cell bond now has two new variables. It has a sigma i alpha variable and a sigma i beta variable. So i is the bond index, and alpha beta is the cell index. So each bond has now two variables for the two cells. And um, these variables change dynamically in time with rules that ensure that within a cell, the overall level is constant, the conservation of the number. They blue and red repel each other. And blue and red attract each other when they are sitting on the same bond. And this can be done in a simple way, defining a function for some energy and a dynamics which someone tries to minimize this energy. We don't think of this as a real energy. It's just a simple way to set up a model that follows these, right, these rules. We also allow, um, in general, a coupling between these PCP molecules and, and cell elongation, which essentially means that the properties of these molecules also depend on how long the bonds are. And now one can ask, can, would one get order in such a system if we first build a tissue, then initialize these variables sort of in an uncoordinated way, and let the system evolve in time? That's an example of what, what you see here. And I don't draw here the bond variables. I only draw vectors calculated for each cell that is taken from the bond variables. The system is based on bond variables. And then you see you get a local coupling. They tend to align locally. But because of the initial disorder, you don't get a globally ordered pattern. You get these swirls and defects. 
And the fundamental question is, how can this tissue prevent this from happening? How do we get a tissue which has not such defects? Even when it start out, as you saw, from a disordered organization of polarity. And what we propose here is that this can actually work if order is established first in a small system, which then grows, maintaining the order, and propagating it to larger scales. That's an interesting idea, because this is in physical systems, one discusses often how such order can be achieved. But usually, there's no growth involved. So the idea that you can get order at large scales by growing a small system, making it large, is usually not discussed in physics. So here we start from a, now here I show you both the bond variables and the arrows, which is a different version of the movie. We start from a small system. We first let this quickly relax. Growth is slow, and as it grows, it can first sort of tend to align in a small patch. The patch is smaller than the typical distance between the defects you saw before. Therefore, um, it can create a, a nice pattern there. And as it grows, it can maintain this order and carry it to large scales. So that's one important step. So we have now given arguments of how to start from an initial condition that is more or less disordered and small to build up a nice order in large scales. And the next question then is, how does this system go from the wing dimensional disk to the final pupil stage? And since time is short, let me just say a few things. Um, here we measure in the pupil wing. So the same method that I showed you yesterday, watching inside the pupa, the pattern. And this is the polarity pattern at the early times of the pupil stage. This is the polarity pattern at the late times of the pupil stage. During the dynamics of the wing in the pupa that I showed you yesterday, there is a remodeling, reorientation of planar cell polarity. And so you see how the vectors turn. So the order is strong. It rotates. While it rotates, the order gets weaker in between and becomes strong again. And here I show you again the movie of yesterday with flow fields of cells. So what we proposed here is that the actual flows of cells in this process coupled to the orientation of cell polarity and remodels it. And in particular, interesting, if you have such a flow field, one can first calculate deformation rates by taking the spatial gradients of the velocity. So the velocity is a vector. The gradient of the vector of velocity is a tensor, it's a matrix. These velocity gradients can be decomposed in different parts. If one takes a symmetric part of this matrix, one has the shear rate. If one takes the anti-symmetric part of this, of this matrix, one gets the vorticity, the rotation rate. Um, and both of them are important for this remodeling. First, I can show you, OK, this is, again, a picture about how this whole pattern is generated. The wing hinge somehow contracts and then pulls on this tissue, which then stretches and flows. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. If we now just look at the vorticity of the flow, we see that there are clockwise and counterclockwise rotations of the tissue. And those will certainly rot locally rotate tissue patches, and they will rotate polarity. And this is one contribution to the remodeling of tissue polarity in the stage. But if you look at the numbers, it accounts only for a part of the actual rotation of cell, cell polarity in the tissue. Um, and the second contribution we argue comes from the shear, that is the deformation, the shear deformation part of the, of the flow. And here I show you a vertex model simulation with um, cell polarity at an angle. And now we shear this whole, this whole tissue, in this case using anisotropic division. And this rotates the axis of PCP. It's a very general, very generic phenomenon that if you have a shear flow and you have anisotropic objects, they will rotate in a shear flow. Um, one can also bring this up to a continuum description. This, um, let's see the initial and the final polarities. So the general picture is that if you have a flow that is a shear flow, it converges here and diverges here. And you put, a, let's say, a rod-like object in it, it will rotate in the flow. And this is characterized by such an equation where nu is a coefficient that depends on the object. And if nu is negative, one will align with the direction in which the flow expands. And if nu is positive, it will align with the direction where the flow converges. And using this picture, we can 
analyze what's going on in this, in this fly wing, we can measure mu. Um, um, we find that mu is negative. This would be a simulation of this process. Um, time is up. Maybe just as a final word, we can also use this to understand mutants. Um, without going into any details, just to show you these two slides. So these are, these are different mutants. These are theoretical calculation of patterns which we can calculate using such approaches. And we can essentially, essentially understand a quite large set of certain cell polarity mutants using this idea of coupling of flows to cell polarity. And with that, I should stop here and over to allow you to get some lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>